Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here, um, in particular because I greatly respect the work of the Stegner Center faculty. They are leading lights in environmental law. I also grew up in Idaho, so for me this is a return to old and beloved stomping grounds. Um, I think it's a fair characterization with respect to U.S. lifestyles and looking at them from a sustainability perspective um, to say that we are a society that is living far beyond our means. Uh, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, um, an authoritative assessment on the state of the world's ecosystems and their provision of ecosystem services uh, or the conditions and processes that do nothing short of sustain human life uh, by purifying our air and water and renewing soil fertility issued the following stark warning. Human activity is putting such strain on the natural functions of Earth that the ability of the planet's ecosystems to sustain future generations can no longer be taken for granted. And so to think about that for a moment, the ability of the planet's ecosystems to sustain future generations can no longer be taken for granted. There are a variety of indicators that confirm this assessment from the perspective of biodiversity. Many scientists agree we are in the midst of, of, we are in the midst of the sixth great, great wave of extinction. The current rate of extinction is estimated to be a thousand times the natural rate. Our ocean's ecosystems are under unprecedented stress. The UN Food and Agricultural Organi Organization estimates that two-thirds of our world's fisheries are currently under threat from overfishing. Dead zones of low oxygen now appear regularly in a variety of water bodies, including the Gulf of Mexico. And the acidification of the ocean, occasioned by climate change, uh, is wreaking additional havoc. Toxics have permeated to the far reaches of the wild and deep within us. Dead whales washed up on beaches um, have been discovered to have levels of toxic compounds so high that their corp corpses were legally classified as hazardous waste. Persistent organic pollutants are routinely discovered in the blood of polar bears and also the breast milk of human mothers. One, um, I think it's fair to say that current lifestyles in the U.S. are deeply unsustainable. One formula that's commonly used to give a rough estimate um, of the environmental impact of a society uh, is to look at the society's population affluence or consumption per person and technology um, or technological sophistication, um, which uh, gives you a rough sense of the environmental impact per unit of consumption. In 1991, Paul Eakins, uh, in, in <coughs> writing in the, con the Sustainable Consumer Society, A Contradiction in Terms, um, uh, offered by one calculation uh, to achieve sustainability, we would need a 93% reduction in the average environmental impact per person. So in short, we stand on the precipice of environmental crisis traceable to our own deeply unsustainable patterns and levels of consumption. But what is perhaps um, most alarming um, is the widespread ignorance that the way we live is endangering the world we live in. We live in an age characterized by, in, in Richard Lazarus's words, a cognitive severance of environmental effect. In other words, we are so removed from our sources of food, energy, and natural resources that we, in, we have um, widespread ignorance of the ecological consequences of our daily activities. <clears throat> in the words of Betsy Taylor and Dave Tilford, we participate in environmental degradations of monumental proportions in a completely anonymous and unconscious fashion. I would submit to you uh, that in order to try to make progress towards sustainability, it's important that we reorient environmental law and policy to restore the cognitive connection between lifestyle and environmental effect and address environmentally significant individual behaviors, including patterns and levels of consumption. So to give you a roadmap of what I want to talk about today, I want to start by talking about why it is I think that it's important to reorient environmental law and policy to more directly embrace individuals and their behaviors as a target of regulation, or in short, why individuals are important. I then want to talk about, um, in this project of in using law and policy to engage individuals, um, to illustrate that meaningful efforts to do so will require information about individuals and their behaviors uh, that will occasion significant privacy concerns. And then I want to close uh, by looking to nuisance law, environmental statutes, um, and privacy jurisprudence to offer some thoughts about the contours of privacy and environmentally significant individual behaviors and how we might go about structuring law and policy uh, in a way to successfully navigate those privacy concerns. Uh, so to turn first um, to my initial point, which is that um, I believe it's important to reorient our environmental law and policy long traditionally um, aimed in its focus at, at industrial and commercial sources of pollution. <clears throat> 
um, to embrace individuals and their behaviors as a target of regulation in order to achieve sustainability. Or in short, why, why are individuals important? And I would submit to you that there are two ways that individuals are, are very important. The first is individuals as a category of environmental harms are an increasingly important source of those harms. And second, individuals um, are uh, uh, necessary. They're a large repository of political will um, to um, uh, make the changes that we need uh, to make progress towards sustainability. Um, so in terms of individuals as a source of harm, I have to take a moment um, to genuflect to Michael Vandenberg, who in a 2004 article from Smokestack to SUV, um, uh, demonstrated that looking to only to activities over which individuals have direct control, individuals are not only a significant source of pollution across a variety of environmental media, but they are often a source of pollution that rivals or even exceeds industrial sources. In some sense, this is a great thing because it means our environmental law and policy to date has done a pretty good job um, of uh, regulating industrial and commercial sources of pollution. But I think it also illustrates a blind spot uh, in our policy. With respect to air emissions, for example, individuals and households contribute more than 30% of all low-level ozone precur precursors nationwide. In 1996, individuals emitted over 55,000 tons of formaldehyde from mobile sources as compared to roughly 6,000 tons emitted by large industrial facilities. Individuals' mobile source use alone, excluding releases from other individual and household activities, released over three times more acetylhyde, an air pollutant and probable human carcinogen, and almost 50 times more benzene to air than all large industrial facilities combined. With respect to water emissions, the quantity of mercury released to water by households is roughly equivalent to the quantity released to surface water from all industrial facilities. So what I want to take a moment to do is to use climate change as an example to you of how important individuals are as a source of environmental harms and also the home of political will to address environmental problems. Um, in terms of climate change, um, oft-cited estimates of the greenhouse gas emissions attributable uh, to different sectors of the United States economy, often estimate that direct emissions of greenhouse gases attributable to individuals or households constitute about 30 to 40 percent of U.S. emissions. We talk about direct emissions. We're talking about, for example, the tailpipe emissions um, from private transportation, driving a car, uh, home energy consumption. This is really driven. That estimate is really uh, looking to individuals um, and households and primarily looking to home energy consumption and private transportation. Now, 30 to 40 percent um, is certainly significant. Um, however, um, estimates of the greenhouse gas emissions attributable to individuals are far greater when you include indirect emissions. And what I'm talking about when I say indirect emissions are emissions that occur in the preparation or production and delivery of a product or service before its use. So for example, sure, when you drive your car, you're emitting greenhouse gases. But there are also greenhouse gases embodied in the car itself and its production and delivery to you, uh, when, you uh, when you purchase it. Um, one study uh, using what it called a consumer lifestyle approach attempted to capture individuals' contribution to greenhouse gases and energy consumption, um, attempted to capture both direct and indirect emissions. Um, using that approach, this study concluded that consumer lifestyle decisions account for 85% of all energy use in the United States and moreover, 102% of US emissions. Now, that should trigger some alarm bells in your head. How is it possible? Uh, <laughs> let's go back and take a look at this study. Uh, but the authors explain uh, the fact that um, um, individuals' direct and indirect um, activities encompass um, over 100% of US emissions by looking to the embodied emissions and imported goods. Um, so. Uh, these figures show both the true magnitude of energy use and emissions attributable to U.S. consumers, as well as the large, large leakage of carbon dioxide through imports of goods serving the needs of U.S. consumers. So for example, if your car is manufactured in China and emissions are released, that is, um, climate change is agnostic. It's whether they're released in China or released here. Um, and that purchase of that car, that consumption of that car, um, incorporates those greenhouse gas emissions. I also want to take a moment um, to address the common perception that um, the reason we, uh, that the primary reason we don't have um, a new federal statute addressed specifically to controlling greenhouse gas emissions in the United States is because we have a powerful oil and glass gas lobby that has effectively de defeated greenhouse gas control proposals. I would submit to you um, that another important factor to consider is to turn the lens back on ourselves. 
um, because views of what is politically accepted to individuals as voting constituencies is also very powerful in defining greenhouse gas control um, options before Congress. Um, so Robert Nordhaus and Kyle Danish um, about a decade ago published um, a white paper, went through here are the various options we have for controlling greenhouse gases in the United States, looking to uh, a couple of different cap and trade type proposals, uh, a carbon tax, some command and control strategies, some um, product um, mandates and various hybrid, hybrid approaches. And what they did is they went through each type of approach um, and evaluated it using a number of criteria. How likely it is that using that approach, um, how cost effective would it be to use that approach? How likely is it that that approach has environmental certainty or would get us to the level of emissions that we need? But in addition, with respect to each, they had a category that they termed um, political uh, feasibility. Um, and in essence, their white paper suggested that a carbon tax was, might be highly recommended, but simply was so politically infeasible that it didn't really warrant for the discussion. Uh, they said, um, um, quote, considerations of political acceptability may lead policymakers away from what otherwise could be an optimal program design with respect to environmental effectiveness, cost, and equity. For example, 25 years of environmental and energy policy experience suggests that it is difficult to gain public support for a program that relies principally on direct increases in the price of energy, either through taxes or regulatory measures, even where such a program arguably is more cost effective or will result in a more equitable distribution of regulatory burdens than other approaches, even in times of most compelling national circumstances, such as the 1973 Arab oil embargo, Congress was unwilling to use energy price increases to rein in consumer demand. In support of Danish and Nordhaus's assessment, um, I would note that uh, leading critiques of cap and trade proposals, of the cap and trade proposals that have been offered in Congress, often emphasize the impacts on consumers, everything from the typical rising energy costs to raising alarms about the discomfort that people will experience if they have to use less heating and cooling, or the annoyance of driving smaller cars that might flow um, uh, from cap and trade programs. Uh, and finally, in terms of thinking about climate change and the importance of individuals, um, I think it's important to note individuals are not only large, large um, consumers of, of energy, but reducing energy demand is going to be a necessary component of any meaningful progress um, toward reducing our emissions. Why? Well, options for new sources of low carbon energy um, uh, just aren't sufficient. They aren't coming online quickly enough uh, to solve this problem without reducing demand as well. With respect to climate change then, um, I think this is a good example um, of when I say I think it's important to engage individuals both because individuals are sources, important sources um, of environmental harm, and because they are a repository of political, uh, political will, I think climate change provides a good example um, of, of why that is the case. Once we accept the idea that it would be useful uh, or even necessary for environmental law and policy to do a better job of targeting individuals uh, through regulation, the next question becomes how. And I would submit to you that every modality for trying to use law to influence what I'll call environmentally significant individual behaviors. And what I mean by that are um, actions, everyday behaviors we, we engage in that while individually de minimis, um, when added together and in the aggregate, have significant environmental harms. I would submit to you that every modality for using law to influence environmentally significant individual, individual behaviors would benefit from and in some instances must have information about those behaviors. We need information about environmentally significant individual behaviors to effectively address laws to those behaviors, and that in turn raises significant privacy concerns. So to take a step back, um, I'm going to borrow a taxonomy, um, a taxonomy from Lawrence Lessig, where he essentially divides the strategies you might, you might use, the legal strategies one might use to influence behavior into four categories. Um, informational regulation and norm management, markets, architecture, and mandates. And I'll go through each and talk a little bit about the information, um, why it is that with respect to each, um, we might need information about environmentally significant individual behaviors. So turning first to informational regulation and norm management, what we're really talking about there is trying to use law to convince people to voluntarily change, uh, make changes in how they behave. Now, this might happen simply by providing them with information. So, for example, you might have a circumstance where someone already possesses an abstract norm, I wish to protect the environment. You might just have a situation where somebody likes to save money. In either case, they might be missing a piece of information that would help them connect up a concrete behavior 
to, to one of those beliefs or desires. Uh, so for, um, for example, um, if you think about driving your car, we all understand at a basic level that when we drive our car, we use gas, that costs money, and that might not be good for the environment. Um, however, uh, there are um, a whole host of ways that we drive, the amount of time that we spend idling, the speeds at which we accelerate, the speeds at which we drive that influence the amount of gas that we use. You can imagine in terms of just hypothesizing about a policy option, a product mandate that might require that GPS systems include a daily driving report be flashed up for the driver that tells drivers how their driving behaviors have contributed to gas waste in this particular day. Similarly, um, and what is that doing? Uh, that is taking someone with a pre-existing norm, I want to use less gas to protect the environment, or somebody who just wants to save a buck, and giving them a piece of information, how your behaviors are wasting gas, um, to encourage a voluntary change in behavior. Similarly, if you look at um, smart meter technology, so what are, what are smart meters? Um, smart meters are essentially an advancement in how your utility communicates to you uh, the amount of energy that you're using. So instead of getting an end of the month bill, here's the total amount of energy that you used, a smart meter uh, might provide you with far more nuance. This is um, a view or description of even how much energy particular appliances in your home are, are using, and sometimes even in real time. You might be able to look at a screen if you have a home energy management system and see that. Um, for similar reasons, you might have um, a, a belief, I want to protect the environment, I want to use less electricity because I want to protect the environment, I want to use less electricity because I want to save money. Um, you might have um, uh, uh, not much idea how to do that in your home, but a smart meter might provide you with information to allow you to do that. A second way um, that um, um, we might use information regulation or norm management to voluntarily change behaviors is to try to use law to instill or strengthen social norms. When I'm talking about social norms, what I'm talking about are simply people engaging in behaviors because they think they should. But what it really boils down to is because you think other people are watching and you're worried about what they think about you. Um, but, um, uh, and one way to do that is to try to make individual behaviors and the harms that they occasion more visible uh, and more comparable. Um, there's a really fascinating um, study that a hospital did where they um, installed little surveillance cameras over the sinks in patient rooms. And all that was visible were the hands under the camera, no face, no identifying information and the like. And what they did is that they used these cameras um, to anonymously track um, the frequency and duration of proper hand washing procedures in the hospital. And they posted this on, li on little, I forget what we call them, the screens up in the, um, up in the hallway. Um, and they saw, just by virtue of that surveillance, um, the hand washing rate rise from about, the proper hand washing rate rise from about 7% to about 87%. Um, and what this, um, another kind of example of how this might happen for you, so, um, uh, the product mandate I suggested and not suggested, I contemplated um, with respect to a GPS system that gives you a daily driving report, you take that a step for further and you imagine your daily driving report not only tells you, wow, you accelerated X amount and that wasted this much gas, but also gave you a little report of how you're driving, how efficient your driving behaviors were compared to other commuters in your area on the same day and time. Um, would be an example of matching you up against other people to encourage um, social norms there are you, some utilities that are already using this. So for example, on your monthly utility bill, you might get a smiley face if you are really efficient compared to other simil similarly situated households, or a frowny face if you're not, uh, which is the same basic idea. Um, there is a program that Microsoft tested. I think it, it was tested, I, I don't know, I'll say this, I don't know, it was beta tested, whatever that means. Um, but there, it's not, as far as I know, not live now. But essentially what it was is you could go onto a website and click on, you know, one of those fancy satellite images, click on a home and get an overview of the electric, electricity usage of that home. And they, they were able to compile that using a variety of um, publicly available information. So another, um, um, uh, and with respect to all of these, I, hope, I think you can see information about the behaviors, uh, both being developed and being used is integrally important. Um, this is also true with respect to another modality we might use to try to change people's behavior, which is a market modality, or essentially change the price. Make things that are environmentally bad more expensive and environmentally good less expensive. Um, one of the difficulties with using price um, to influence individual behavior is that individuals tend not to be particularly, um, we're not very good or rational at responding to price signals. Um, so to give you a, a for example, one reason for this is we raise the price of, price of energy, but you don't know how appliances in your home are using or wasting energy, you might not be able to change a behavior to respond to that price signal. 
Um, similarly, um, one way that we can use the market to try to get people to change their behaviors is by charging people for consuming public environmental goods. However, um, it can be incredibly difficult to figure out who's using how much of a public, um, a public environmental good. Technology is also helping us out here. So if you think about programs, um, proposals for congestion pricing or the type of congestion pricing that they're using in London, for example, um, one administratively feasible way to do that is people have the little easy pass system in their car and you're getting charged more when you're going into a city center at certain, uh, at certain times of day. Um, again, what's required for this to work is we have to have information about who's using how much of a public environmental good uh, and when. Um, another modality, a third modality for trying to influence environmentally significant behaviors would be to change the archi change architecture or features of the world. This is essentially um, our behaviors are in part shaped by the world as we find it. You may want to reduce your um, carbon footprint. You may have a burning desire to reduce your carbon footprint, but if you live in a place where there's no public transportation, that's one significant option that's unavailable to you. So we might use zoning and, um, and a variety of other ways of constructing uh, the built world to influence energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. In order to shape architecture and reduce environmental harms from individual behaviors, however, we first have to understand how existing architecture is shaping behavior and then protect and monitor the effects of changing that architecture because it can be a relatively complex inquiry. And finally, um, one, last, um, one last way we might go about trying to change people's environmentally significant individual behaviors would be just flat out, what we think, when, we, when we say law, what you think of when we say law, if you litter, you get a fine. It's against the law to litter, and you get a fine if you litter, a mandate or a sanction. Now, one of the, um, in the context of looking at individuals as regulatory targets, one of the great difficulties that employing one, and I'll say one, there are others, <laughs> but one of the great difficulties um, that employing mandates encounters is that when you have millions and millions of people who are being regulated, the administrative costs of enforcement uh, can be prohibitive. Um, again, technology uh, is perhaps um, uh, ameliorating that objection to some extent. So for example, there are some municipalities that have radio frequency identification tags um, in the, the um, uh, recycling containers and the waste containers and are using that technology to track who's separating, separating their recyclables, um, how much garbage are people throwing away. Um, that could be helpful, for example, in New York City where I live, if you don't sort your recycling properly, you get a fine. That's certainly going to be a lot easier to administer if there's an electronic component. But again, I hope you see this is collecting information about individuals. Not everyone's going to like the idea um, of a radio frequency identification tag and a computer system that is tracking the volume of their garbage and the way that they're sorting their recycling. So. Um, I would submit to you that information about environmentally significant individual behaviors will be helpful, if not necessary, for each kind of primary way we might go about trying to use law to change um, behavior. Technology is increasingly um, opening up new doors for, f that reduce the administrative costs uh, of trying to do so. Uh, but before we, and, and this is you know, rather simple, before we can educate people about how their behaviors are impacting the environment or intervene to change those behaviors, whether through norms, price, architecture, or a mandate, we need to know what those behaviors are, when and why they're occurring, and how they are likely to and do respond to regulatory invention, which will often demand information about those behaviors. And sometimes these strategies will um, not only require information about individuals, but generate new information that's never been, um, never been collected, recorded, or stored about individuals. And all of this can create privacy concerns. Now, um, I could talk to you a bit about the privacy concerns that this creates, but it turns out that Audi did a much better job of it than I think I ever could. So what I want to show you now, um, let's see. Dale, my, let's see. I pressed it. So a few years ago, um, Audi um, uh, aired a commercial during the Super Bowl that I think is a really um, pithy exemplar of some of the privacy concerns that regulating environmentally significant individual behaviors um, uh, can, uh, can create. And perhaps in the fine tradition of Super Bowl commercials, it's very punchy <laughs> and very entertaining. Um, OK, so I'm told we, we, have, we have a 55 second countdown. Um, so <laughs> uh, I think it's only fitting in, in, in a talk that is praising the potential for technology to have a technological snafu. Um, 
so when we think about the private privacy concerns that are being raised, in part, I think the privacy concerns are coming up because we simply have technology now that can monitor, track, store, sift information about people um, in a way we never could before. Um, I would also submit to you that um, when we're thinking about privacy harms, um, we would do ourselves, if you look at the privacy scholarship that's out there, and I will say for an environmental law scholar to try to dip a toe into the privacy literature, they are deep and muddy waters, um, of which I am um, only skimming the surface. But the privacy harms that we recognize in tort and constitutional law are really the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there are a variety of other, um, of other privacy harms that I'll talk about in a second, because I think my countdown is done and I can, uh, I can start. Um, okay, and I should add here, I have no relationship to Audi. I don't really know anything at all uh, about, about the product, but I do find um, the ad useful for my, uh, my illustrative purposes. Um, so when we think about uh, privacy harms, I think if you were going to limit yourself to, well, what are the, what are the uh, privacy harms we recognize in tort law and constitutional law? Uh, that doesn't really give you a sense of the full range of privacy harms that will inform and would be relevant to this kind of discussion, decisions about what it's appropriate for government to do in terms of uh, actually thinking about how to structure policy. So Daniel Solov has come up with um, um, kind of a listing um, of privacy harms uh, that he characterizes as privacy harms and problems that have achieved a significant degree of social recognition. And he divides them into a few categories, harms related to information collection, information processing, information dissemination, and invasion. And what I want to do is just briefly talk to you about how smart meters would impose privacy harms in all those categories, or at least potentially in all of those categories. So for example, with respect to information collection, um, smart meter could give rise to harms related to surveillance. You're essentially monitoring people in their own homes. And I will say, if you look at a smart meter, a smart meter can tell you the person who lives at this address is running their dishwasher now. You can learn a lot about someone. This is when they tend to flush their toilets. This is when, I mean, your, the electricity signature contains an enormous amount of information about the way people, uh, the way people live. Um, it might also pose an information processing risk, the risk of what uh, Solov terms insecurity, or the risk of once this information is generated that it could be misappropriated. There's also a potential privacy harm related to information dissemination, um, one related to disclosure or the revealing of true information about someone. For example, imagine you have an entity with access to household energy that then sells that information to a marketing firm. Um, and finally, there's, argu there's arguably, and this is, well, uh, a harm related to invasion or intrusion, invasion of solitude, uh, this idea that the installation and operation of a smart meter um, is simply um, an invasion of solitude. Um, so um, attempts to limit the privacy harms um, associated with our efforts to get a handle on environmental behaviors and influence them can constrain um, the utility of policy. So for example, in the context of smart meters, there has been significant hue and cry um, in the, uh, about the potential privacy problems. Public utility commissions in response have adopted some policies that arguably limit the utility of smart meters for purposes of changing people's behaviors. So for example, many utilities have now adopted opt-out policies. So if you're a consumer in that area, you choose not to have the smart meter, you don't have to. Some um, consumers, I, I mentioned before, um, in order for smart meter information to help change people's behaviors and conserve energy at home, it's important that it be delivered in a way um, that is accessible. Um, so uh, and that's where you add um, something called a home energy monitoring system onto the smart meter data that will present it to people at home in a way that they can access and understand it's actually going to be most helpful in terms of directing their behavior. 
many utilities have um, made that an opt-in program. So if you want a home energy system, you have to actually have to sign a consent form. It becomes an opt-in program. It's going to reduce the extent to which it's actually used. Um, and finally, they've adopted a variety of privacy policies about what can be done with smart meter data that might make it less available for use in um, environmental policymaking. Um, and I think all of this together underscores the need if you're serious about trying to change individual behaviors and using law to do that, to think about um, uh, the concept of environmental privacy or privacy and environmentally significant individual behaviors. And again, what I'm talking about, what I want to turn to now is to try to think about some of the contours of expectations of privacy and um, personal environmental information. And what I mean by that is simply information about individual behaviors that while individually benign, collectively impose and in the aggregate impose significant environmental harms. Um, these behaviors um, generally impose extern externalities, albeit slight, um, and often have at least one aspect that is in some sense public. So to give you an example of what I'm talking about, I'm talking here about um, individual tailpipe emissions, home pesticide application, the disposal of hazardous waste and household garbage. Those are kind of examples of direct activities and, and indirect as well. So consumption with indirect impacts, whether it's the consumption of energy or the purchase of goods and services that embody uh, environmental harms. Um, so to try to get, this has proven a real challenge for me to try to, to how do you go about getting at what are the contours of um, privacy and personal environmental information. Um, so what I do is in addition to looking at the privacy jurisprudence that I, that I already talked about, um, I look to um, environmental common law and in particular nuisance um, and then also our experience under existing environmental statutes to try to glean some information about what the contours of privacy um, in personal environmental information might be. Um, so with respect to private, um, private nuisance, um, looking at private nuisance, I think you can pull out a principle that is potentially helpful for thinking about privacy in environmentally significant individual behaviors. And that is, um, as a general matter, I think it's fair to say there is a reduced expectation of privacy or even sometimes a privacy waiver where conduct imposes an environmental externality. And I, you, I think I pull that principle from this notion that if you look to the, from looking to um, a variety of aspects of, a, of nuisance, first the elements of a nuisance claim itself, second the form that discovery often takes in nuisance actions, and finally the way that nuisance intersects with, a, with um, two different constitutional doctrines. So turning first to elements of nuisance, um, and I'm talking here about um, private nuisance. So the traditional common law rule holds um, that um, your conduct gives rise to a nuisance only if it creates an unreasonable interference with private use and enjoyment of land. And the key question there is when is it, when is it unreasonable? Most courts, in terms of under, um, figuring out whether um, an interference is unreasonable, either in determining whether a nuisance exists or fashioning the remedy for that nuisance, use some kind of balancing test. And what's being balanced is uh, the gravity of the harm that's being occasioned versus the utility of the alleged nuisancer's conduct. And so what on earth does that, does that have to do about uh, do with privacy? Well, in short, the legal test um, for identifying nuisance or fashioning a remedy for nuisance presumes that, that you need to come forward and talk about there's no privacy in that conduct that is alleged to be um, nuisancing conduct, either in its con um, so, um, and this in turn now turning to discovery and nuisance actions is reflected both in the broad scope of nuisance interrogatories, um, which are often um, uh, inquire into the purpose and use of real estate and the nature of business conducted thereon. In addition, discovery rules permit the inspection of property and entry onto an inspection of property is often deemed appropriate um, in nuisance cases where the condition of property is deemed to be directly at issue. In reviewing those discovery orders, courts balance the degree to which inspection would aid the search for truth against the burdens of inspection, including the invasion of privacy. And courts often approve relatively expansive discovery orders in the context of nuisance actions. So for example, in 2010, the Supreme Court um, of Alaska allowed um, a plaintiff neighbor who alleged that his neighbor was creating a nuisance by using his property as a junkyard um, to, um, they issued a discovery order, quote, for purposes of conducting an inspection of the items placed upon your land to determine whether or not hazardous substances exist that could present a threat to the neighbors surrounding your property and or the groundwater beneath their, pr their property. The order was granted only on the condition that it not extend to inside, uh, inside the residence. Um, and finally, um, there are two ways that, that nuisance intersects with constitutional doctrines um, in an interesting way. 
that, that likewise, I think, illustrates this concept of a privacy waiver or reduced expectation of privacy. The first is with respect to the community caretaking doctrine. Um, so some courts have found, this is um, under the Fourth Amendment, some courts have found that government officers can enter a property to abate a nuisance without a warrant. I think this is perhaps the clearest expression of the idea that externality causing conduct can affect a waiver of privacy. And perhaps the leading case on the community caretaking exception, the Sixth, Sixth Circuit in United States versus Roreg, um, the court upheld a warrantless search where officers entered a private residence after there were noise complaints and discovered drugs. And the court observed, just as one's expectation of privacy diminishes as he ventures beyond his doorway, defendant here undermined his right to be left alone by projecting loud noises into the neighborhood in the wee hours of the morning. There's also a nuisance exception in takings doctrine um, that provides there's no regulatory taking even where a landowner would be deprived of all economically beneficial use of property where the property is deemed a nuisance under the common law. In describing the inquiry to be undertaken to assess whether the nuisance exception applies, the Supreme Court cites to the restatement second of torts and advises that it will ordinarily entail analysis of, among other things, the degree of harm to public lands and resources or adjacent private, private property posed by the claimant's proposed activities, the social value of the claimant's activities, and their suitability to the locality in question. Again, no concept that the claimant's activities are entitled to privacy. Um, once we're in, and, and this uh, arising in the context of application of a nuisance exception or the question of whether a regulation gives rise, a government regulation gives rise uh, to a taking. So I would submit to you that we can look to nuisance law, and I think it generally supports the view um, that there is some sense um, that expectations of privacy um, can be lower or in some sense waived to the extent that conduct is giving rise to an environmental externality. But just taking that and trying to apply it to environmentally significant individual behaviors just doesn't work. In part, why? Well, it's the problem of aggregation, right? So when we're talking about environmentally significant individual behaviors, you're not talking about behaviors that, con that individually constitute actionable private nuisances. Um, in order for harms to accrue, they need to be aggregated, sometimes over long periods of time. You're not going to be able to look at a specific piece of property and say, well, there's a significant harm occurring here today because 10 years ago, um, KDQ in New York um, drove to work instead of taking the train, right? Uh, it, just, it, just doesn't, um, it just doesn't work. Now, what do we generally do in environmental law when we're faced with the problems of aggregation like this? Um, we enact a statute. So that was my, my, next, my next stop, was to look at um, the structure and enforcement of existing environmental statutes to see what they might reveal about expectations of privacy and environmentally significant individual behavior. Now, most environmental statutes require regulated entities um, to divulge a significant amount of information. Everything from the toxic release inventory, which requires certain categories of emitters, uh, to annually report on their volume of emissions of certain chemicals. Um, a regulated entity that wishes to obtain a, a permit under the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act is going to be required to submit large volumes of information and comply with sometimes onerous record keeping and reporting requirements. There's also copious case law and scholarly writing about the constitutional limits of what is termed environmental surveillance, or this idea uh, um, about the constitutional bounds of monitoring to enforce environmental statutes. So for example, in Dow Chemical versus the United States, the Supreme Court upheld EPA's use of aerial photography in a Clean Air Act site inspection. And there are also many examples where um, privacy interests are held to cede to the requirements of the administration enforcement of environmental statutes. Perhaps the best example and in the context of the forced Fourth Amendment, um, there is um, what is termed the pervasively regulated industry administrative ser search exception, where courts have upheld warrantless ser administrative searches under a variety of environmental statutes, including the New Jersey Water Pollution Control Act, the Fishery Conservation and Management Act, and the Pennsylvania Solid Waste Management Act. However, with all of this out there, I found it enormously challenging to find an appropriate analog for privacy in environmentally significant individual behaviors. Why? Well, as I I mentioned before, most of these environmental statutes are directed to um, industrial or corporate entities as opposed to individuals. Second, some of these statutes, to the extent that they're dealing with nuisance-like harms in the context of CERCLA, for example, that's not really a case of small harms aggregated. That's more nuisance-like in its content. Um, and finally, when you think about the, the constitutional contours of privacy, what I was really looking for in an analog was um, an issue that gave rise to enough court discussion or enough analysis there was something there uh, to look at. Um, in terms of kind of the relevant uh, uh, constitutional parameters for privacy, 
Um, there are really two strands that might be relevant to us. One is Whalen versus Roe, which involves informational privacy um, and the individual interest in avoiding disclosure of personal, personal matters. Um, that's been recognized by the Supreme Court, never developed since Whalen versus Roe, recognized by some appellate courts, but there's just simply not, um, n not, not many disputes that sound in that area of law. So what we're really limited to is Fourth Amendment. And once you narrow it down to it's got to be directed to individuals, involve a harm, environmental harm that requires aggregation, um, and, is a, and gives rise to a dispute under the Fourth Amendment, it's a very narrow uh, world indeed. The subset of cases I found that I thought was potentially interesting were a series of what I think of as hunter enforcement cases or hunting and fishing enforcement cases. So um, cases where uh, you have um, state laws, primarily state laws, um, addressed to putting limits on hunters and fishermen uh, in a state. It's obviously addressed to individuals. These are not, this is not commercial fishing. This is individual uh, fishermen. Um, does it uh, involve aggregated harms? Well, yes, in the sense that one person taking one fish out of season doesn't give rise to um, harm per se. It's when it's uncontrolled that we might have harm. So in a sense, the aggregation um, requirement is satisfied. Um, and finally, the enforcement of these statutes have given rise to Fourth Amendment questions on a variety of occasions. Um, so there are a couple of privacy um, principles and considerations visible in the hunter enforcement cases that I think are useful for thinking more broadly about environmental privacy and environmentally significant individual behaviors. The first is, it becomes clear looking, looking at these cases, there's a significant distinction when we move from regulating uh, commercial entities and industry to directing law toward individuals, the privacy considerations are heightened, they're more sensitive, and they're just different. And, and how, does this, uh, how do you see this in these cases? Well, I mentioned before this concept, this pervasively regulated industry administrative search uh, concept, or in other words, some circumstances in which uh, courts have held that government agents don't need um, a warrant where the search that's being conducted is directed to um, an entity or within an industry that is so closely regulated that they don't really have expectations of uh, privacy. The searches need to be necessary for implementation of the regulatory scheme. The courts look to it and they say, well, the extent of regulation really lowers the expectations of privacy. And then they look to the statute authorizing the search and they want to see some protections for privacy interests. What's interesting here is what courts have done Courts have kind of gone all over the place in terms of does this concept, this closely regulated or pervasively regulated industry administrative search exception, apply when we're talking about individuals in the context of the hunter enforcement cases. Um, in 2012, the California Supreme Court upheld a game warden's warrantless search of an individual. The game warden had been watching him fish on a pier um, and thought that he might have illegally caught a spiny lobster, um, went down, pulled him over. Um, and without a warrant, searched the car and found, found the illegally obtained um, lobster. En route to upholding that search, the California Supreme Court observed numerous cases established that the existence of pervasive regulation can diminish the reasonable expectation of individuals as well as businesses. In 2002, however, uh, the Supreme Court of Minnesota had declined to extend the closely regulated business line of cases to a game warden's search of a fish house, observing that those cases are limited to industries in a narrow field of commercial activity. This concept that there is, um, when we're talking about privacy, commercial and industry versus individuals, that there's a difference, um, uh, pervades um, privacy jurisprudence. In Dow Chemical, for example, the environmental surveillance case I mentioned before, uh, the Supreme Court, in upholding warrantless aerial surveillance of an industrial plant as part of a Clean Air Act site inspection, observed, we find it important that this is not an area immediately adjacent to a private home where privacy, privacy expectations are most heightened. Second. Um, another concept that arises in looking at these hunter enforcement cases that I think is useful to think about is that when courts are willing to relax um, privacy, um, uh, be more forgiving about the application of the Fourth Amendment with respect to these hunters and, and fishermen, um, something that they emphasize in their reasoning is that hunters are a narrow class, they can be deemed to have consented to regulation, and something that arises uh, or that becomes clear is that when we're thinking about, um, I tend to think about aggregation in terms of lots of different people contributing small harms, aggregating to create a big environmental harm. Well, it turns out when you think about it, the same is true of privacy harms. So where um, government regulation um, is aimed at activities um, that are widespread and common and we all engage in, um, the diminishment of privacy is also aggregated and creates a bigger harm. So to give you a sense, so, um, uh, this is also um, becomes apparent in um, 
other contexts. So in Delaware versus Prowse, the Supreme Court um, found that roving vehicle stops for license and registration checks of drivers violated the First Amendment. Um, it observed an individual operating or traveling in an automobile does not lose all reasonable expectation of privacy simply because the automobile and its use are subject to government regulation. Automobile travel is a basic, pervasive, and often necessary mode um, of transportation. The same context, when we start talking about trying to get, use law to get at behaviors we're all engaging in every day, um, privacy waiver with respect to that um, uh, would be significant um, because we would be aggregate it, aggregating it across society. Um, and finally, um, and I know a lot of you are relieved to hear me say finally because I know I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, one of the key questions in, when, uh, in the privacy jurisprudence, it seems to me, and I, well, I should not just seems to me, but I, I had a, a faculty member who teaches in the area at my law school, so it always just comes down to balancing. You're balancing the um, privacy harms and the benefits to society. It all comes down to balancing. Something that's, um, that's interesting, looking to the hunter enforcement cases, um, is that there is a recognition that when you're assessing the state interest, when the government goes about trying to regulate millions of uh, uh, individuals, it creates unique difficulties for the administration and enforcement of the statute, which is a justification that heightens the state interest, that gives it special weight. So for example, the Oregon Supreme Court, in upholding warrantless game checkpoint stops, um, uh, observed, uh, noted um, that um, Oregon, that recreational hunting and fit, that um, over a million recreational hunting and fishing licenses had been sold in Oregon, that over a half of Oregon's roughly 100,000 square miles is publicly owned, um, and emphasized the, quote, task which faces game law enforcement uh, personnel in carrying out the, wildly, the wildlife policy. This is, the uh, Supreme Court has also recognized this, although not in the environmental context, so in United States, or I'm sorry, in Camara versus San Francisco, the Supreme Court held that a home inspection, I think for building inspection purposes, um, does require a warrant, but they relax the showing required to obtain a warrant in recognition of the special difficulties posed when government is trying to regulate lots and lots of people as opposed to a smaller group. Um, in conclusion, so what do I take from all of this? Um, what are the contours of environmental privacy? Or more importantly, when we start to think about, in a serious way, about using law, directing it to individuals as targets of environmental regulation, um, what are some things we might think about in terms of designing that policy to avoid stumbling on privacy harms? So one general point, I think, is that given that balancing is fundamental to a resolution of privacy conflicts, both um, politically and in terms of application of constitutional limits, um, it is useful to note that aggregated environmental harms imposed by individual behavior are recognized already as a state interest. Uh, but also um, that because we're talking about everyday behaviors, the privacy harms are aggregated um, as well. I would submit that it's enormously important since we're engaging balancing and part of the project here is understanding the state interest. We have to make the case for why the information is, um, is necessary and we also have to make the case for why it is that these individual behaviors need to be regulated. Um, second, uh, this principle that um, I think nuisance doctrine principle that it offers that um, there may be reduced expectations of privacy when um, behaviors or conduct um, gives rise to an externality also underscores the importance for us to develop and publicize our understanding of the connection between environmentally significant individual behaviors and harm. That cognitive, um, that lack of cognitive connection between what I do and the world I live in, somehow in order for this balancing of privacy and um, and the state interest in helping to change those behaviors, there simply has to be a better understanding uh, of the connection between behaviors and environmental harms. Um, and finally, there the two kind of major takeaway points that I would have are first, tread carefully, and second, take the path of least resistance. So in terms of tread, tread carefully, we cannot look to our prior experience regulating business and industry and assume that the same types of information collection uh, and use are appropriate in the context of individuals. Um, similarly, we can't simply look to constitutional limits, um, constitutional privacy limits, or uh, the scope of tort recovery to adduce the full range of relevant privacy considerations. Uh, and finally, in terms of the path of least resistance, um, it's clear that information collection um, seems to engender fewer concerns than enforcement or what the Supreme Court terms affirmative, unannounced, narrowly focused intrusions in the context of the Fourth Amendment. 
And finally, to the extent that we have a public handle on these harms uh, or on behaviors, um, we should use it where possible. Much environmental surveillance is justified because it falls uh, under the Fourth Amendment because it falls within the scope of the open fields exception. To the extent we have an option and there's a public handle on environmental behavior, we should uh, try to take it and use it to avoid some of the privacy objections that might be raised. Absolutely. I could, I could not agree, agree more with you. I think um, in terms of um, environmental federalism, when we think about, um, I think municipalities are, um, have, offer significant advantages in terms of um, trying to use law to get at individual behaviors. I think some of the big structural stuff is probably better addressed at the federal level. But absolutely, and I've never thought of it before in terms of the bubble concept, but I love that idea. Um, it is, um, so at one point um, I wrote something trying to, arguing that municipalities are in a particularly good position, especially when it comes to norm management, um, in part because they just have so much more information about, if you're thinking about trying to get people to voluntarily change their behavior, so much of it is indexed to, first of all, it's an uphill battle. If, it's, if it costs money, it's not gonna happen. If it's really inconvenient for people, it's not gonna happen. So many of those questions are intense, very local um, in their resolution. If someone's gonna, gonna um, take the subway versus take a car, it's obviously a completely different inquiry in Filer, Idaho than it is in New York City, right? Because of the, the, the built environment, the types of commutes people have, it's just a different way of living that leads to a different calculus when people are making those kinds of decisions. Um, and I couldn't agree more that just on some innate level, if you're thinking about getting a fine for failing to separate your recycling, it coming from Mayor Bloomberg is one thing. It coming from President Obama, a federal agent going through your trash, right? So New York City officials do go through my trash. <laughs> but you, I'm sure we, I mean, um, federal agents going through my trash would be a completely different thing, which also, by the way, I think is a good example of um, when I talk about we can't look to what's constitutionally permissible from a privacy perspective and know what's feasible as a policy matter. So at, under yesterday's Free versus Greenway, the government can go through my trash if it wants to. It doesn't need a warrant. This is, this is um, I've discarded my trash, um, at, at least um, not on the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Fourth Amendment. On the other hand, federal agents going through trash to give fines for recycling, it, I'm dead on arrival, I think, right, in terms of its, its feasibility. Um, it, I, I do have to take um, exception um, to your comment, you don't know much about um, environmental law. I know firsthand you have been a research assistant in environmental law class with me <laughs> in law school. <laughs> so I, I, can't, I can't let that, that, um, that misstatement stand. Thank you. 
your sort of, could you do what you're seeking to accomplish through a consent structure instead of through a sort of new definition of privacy structure? Um, because I could imagine in some ways it would be easier and you wouldn't maybe risk um, watering down privacy in other areas of the law. Would you, would you have a consent to initial searches if they had a browser check? I, I, I think that <coughs> legally it could be done. Yeah, just as legally and, and, and you consent to... That's as close as you get on that. Maybe. Yeah, but I mean legally it can be done just as you consent to blood yeah. testing and breathalyzers for uh, to get your license you I mean, to, to build your house, yeah, it's an unconstitutional. Well, sure, sure, it's going to make some of the pressure, but once you're living in it, and you know, I want to make this thing over here in my house now, or I'm just not consenting, or I just stayed in my house every single night. Yeah, it's the whole doctrine of unconstitutional conditions, where, um, where they now say pretty much that there aren't any. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Consent is absolutely, in those hunter enforcement cases I talked about, is something the courts look to and emphasize that I think illustrates why it's different from environmentally significant individual behaviors in the following sense. So if you look at the pervasively regulated business exception to the, to the Fourth Amendment, something that the courts seem interested in is you have consented to participate in this industry. You have accepted this level of regulation. The courts looking at the hunter enforcement cases seem to find it really important that these um, relaxations of privacy that they are permitting in enforcement of the um, hunting and fishing regulations are limited to the class of persons who have agreed to hunt, have agreed to fish. That uh, consent is absolutely a big part of it. I think it is actually, um, I, I view it as something that is a significant distinction from environmentally significant individual behaviors. The problem is with environmentally significant individual behaviors, you don't consent to live. I mean, in some sense, our entire life is an externality, right, when you boil down to it. Um, and um, th there is, the, in, the, in the cases looking at vehicle stops and things, this notion that getting a license, right, they're not going to relax privacy and view getting a license um, um, uh, permitting these roving vehicle stops. In part, I think what's motivating is this notion that the more widespread the behavior is, in some sense, yes, we're all consenting to be part of, a, part of this society. Um, but so many environmentally significant individual behaviors are lifestyles, so things we're all engaging in every day. I think at some point the consent actually cuts against you. However, um, I do think in terms of my, my list of um, take, the, take the path of least resistance, where you can get consent, it can be the path of least resistance. So where it is, um, and the other kind of example that where this sometimes come up, comes up is um, if you go out and you need to get a permit under an environmental statute, they'll oftentimes look to that as you, you're agreeing to all these record keeping requirements. You can agree um, that you're opening yourself up to um, a variety of enforcement searches under the statute um, and the like. So if we're talking about um, environmentally significant individual behaviors that are um, more limited, it's not something everyone's doing every day, um, like turning on the lights at home, right? Um, but, and now I'm struggling to come up with an example. Um, I don't know, I'm struggling to come up with an example. But I think that could be one of the paths of least resistance is where consent is an option, where the behavior is not so widespread um, that consent can be a useful, um, something useful to turn to. Um, I think it's entirely possible that I am, I am viewing privacy as something to be shushed, um, shushed away to get to my environmental ends. I'm sensitive to that. Um, to that cr critique, in part because I think if that's the attitude you, uh, I'm trying to be useful and inform the structure of policy, and if that's the attitude you take, we take our privacy uh, seriously in this country, <laughs> and we're not allowed to be brushed away. And so I think that that is um, um, a danger of which I have to be aware because I come at this from a perspective of wanting a certain policy end, but hopefully I can take a step back so that my recommendations are sufficiently pragmatic that they're useful. <laughs>
Okay, so um, to respond to the last point um, first, I do think there's enough of this outside of the home that we don't necessarily need to pierce the home. And I do recognize that that's kind of um, the, that's the hardest, the hardest spot. Um, I think there, there are some interesting, um, so arguably the third party doctrine is um, an easy way to get inside the home. So if you think for the, in the context of smart meters, for example, this could potentially be very important. But if you look at Justice Sotomayor's concurrence, United States versus Jones, the future of the third party doctrine seems to be in doubt. So basically, the, um, uh, there is an off, and I can tell, so, and to back up, I'm not playing in my sandbox when I start talking about privacy, so do not assume that I know all of the cases, and I would welcome um, input. I am deeply nervous about my own grasp um, of the um, niceties here. Um, but um, so when you, um, there's the, this public-private distinction that is kind of reviled by privacy scholars, but oftentimes find expression in our privacy law, the basic idea that if you share information with someone, it's no longer private. Um, and one way that this finds expression in constitutional doctrine is um, if you provide information to a third party, all of a sudden the government doesn't need a warrant to get it. And one of the ways this could become relevant in the smart meter context is you're providing information to the utility. Thus, on one argument under the application of the third party doctrine, you have waived your privacy interest um, in that information. Um, now, I think um, hanging our hat on the third party doctrine might be dicey in part because um, the court seems to be becoming increasingly hostile to the kind of, um, to the third party doctrine and its application in an electronic world where it really seems to vitiate um, a lot of um, privacy protections. Um, and so a lot of people seem to think, um, again, it's not my sandbox, but that um, the, the public-private distinction, and in particular the way it's expressed in the context of the third party doctrine, is not long for this world, uh, or at least not long for our doctrinal juris our Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. I don't know if, I don't know, um, um, if that's the case. Uh, but you're right, so I have struggled with this. Um, in short, I think part of the reason why I say I think there's enough environmentally significant individual behavior that happens outside the home, I almost think of it as like a, a, a public handle, and I'm thinking, I'm pulling here, what is, what is the NEPA federal handle? <laughs> so, in my head, so I'm thinking about the public handle. Um, that, so for example, you might um, um, rip open your package of Doritos in your house and throw it away in your house, but you bought the Doritos at the store in front of everybody else. And then, um, which actually is kind of an embarrassing thing to do. You know, when they, speaking of when they started doing those customer courtesy cards, I would actually not use my card when I bought something like Doritos. <laughs> anyway, so you bought the Doritos um, at, the, at the store. Um, you might have consumed them in your house, but you bought them out there, and then you threw it away into your garbage, which went out. So a public handle, right? So I don't have to install a camera in your house to watch you eating Doritos to know you consume them and to trace back to the environmental impacts of the packaging. I might be able to get at that by virtue of, I, through the third-party doctrine, maybe I can access the store's customer convenience card or go through your trash. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you that if we're thinking about balancing, it's hard enough outside the home, inside the home, to try to get someone to agree that a privacy waiver, that the environmental benefits exceed the privacy harm, I think is almost a no. It, it's just not even, I think it's hard to imagine. Katie, thank you very much. We are balancing our time with an upcoming class. <laughs> we'll have to uh, depart. Thank you. Thank you.